Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out for our presentation today. My name is Samantha Gill, and I'm the Public Services Manager here at the Hayes Public Library. And today we have a guest speaker, Bob Wilhelm. Um, some of you might recognize him as he was the director of Fort Hayes, what years? Oh, gosh, I know. It's almost 30 years. 30 years ago. <laughs> um, Bob is going to give a presentation about the Old Fort Hayes, as well as talk about, um, this is one of three of the books that he has. This book is Shadow of Conflict, um, and he does have a couple of books available for sale at the end of his presentation, if anyone is interested. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Bob. Thank you. How's everybody doing this morning? Wonderful. I'm a little nervous, and the fact that there's a camera rolling over there uh, doesn't have anything to do with my anxiety. But um, I, uh, as Samantha said, I was uh, the director of uh, Historic Fort Hayes for a good bit of my time out there uh, for about 30 years, and. Um, I've always wanted to be a writer. I've always wanted to be an author. I've, I've written a lot uh, through my life. Uh, and I can go way back to when I was in about the third grade, uh, the first story that I wrote. And the only reason I remember that is that my mother gave me permission to use my father's typewriter, <laughs> which I was fascinated with. Uh, and uh, so I was able to do that. but. It, uh, as I went through school and, you know, I did a lot of writing in, in uh, English classes and literature classes and things like that while I was in college. And, and uh, I did a lot uh, of filming up reports and things when I was in the service. So, uh, but uh, most of what I wrote was uh, nonfiction. It was just, uh, like I said, reports. And, and uh, when I got to Fort Hayes, uh, the things that I wrote were... Uh, historical and uh, they appeared in uh, the Friends newsletter, and the Society of Friends of Historic Fort Hayes had a newsletter and I wrote a lot of the articles for that. And um, we had a newspaper column when I first started working there and, and so I wrote for that. And, and um, when, when I started working at the fort, um, we, some of you re may remember a big model in the, in the middle of the of the visitor center there, and and visitors would come in, and we'd tell them about the buildings and all that kind of stuff. And eventually, we had to start uh, giving guided tours, and uh, so again, we would take people out and we tell them about the buildings and stuff. Well, I got kind of bored with just telling them about the buildings, and we were always doing research out there, uh, and there were all these stories that I just thought were fascinating and. And through the years, I became really uh, attached, I guess you might say, to the people uh, that were stationed at Fort Hayes and the activities that happened and that kind of thing. And so I started incorporating that into a lot of my uh, talks uh, with visitors. And in fact, uh, the other two, uh, two or three uh, staff that we had there, um, said I got a little too involved in it and my tours ended up being, uh, you know, an hour long or something and, instead of 20 minutes. And, and uh, but anyway, um, after about 30 years, I, I retired in 2013 and I did something that I always wanted to do and that was to write fiction. And they say, you know, to write what you know and, and so I knew a lot about four days. So, I started taking uh, incidents that occurred at Fort Hayes and in the vicinity and constructing stories about that. The historical part of it uh, was, uh, was real, uh, but then primarily what I would add to it is dialogue. So we had the people talking to one another and, and that sort of thing. And uh, so when I retired, I wanted to, I wanted to sit down and write. and. Uh, I got all my work done in the morning. My wife was still working, and, and uh, in the afternoon I'd go to a coffee shop and just sit there and write. I had a laptop like this, and and uh, I just I would just start writing, and I had the greatest time doing that. And uh, I didn't figure that I could 
afford to have uh, an editor and a publicist and all that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff is expensive. But up pops uh, the the uh, uh, books. The the what do I want to say the the self self publishing uh, business started. And uh, so uh, I started writing these books anyway, and the first one deals primarily with the, uh, it's called uh, war, uh, war Clouds on the High Plains, and that deals primarily with the Smoky Hill Trail and activities that uh, occurred along it. Smoky Hill Trail was a stage and freight uh, line that ran uh, from here, from where we are today, about 10 miles south of us along the Smoky Hill River. And one of the stops along the Smoky Hill River, or the Smoky Hill Trail, was Fort Fletcher uh, and later renamed Fort Hayes and that was about 15 miles east of here and uh, later uh, which we'll get into here in a little bit uh, that fort was moved over here south of town so it was actually part of the development of Hayes and uh, the surrounding area here the railroad came through and all that kind of stuff well uh, I started writing these books and uh, I was fortunate enough um, here a few months ago, uh, Samantha invited me to uh, sit in on the author's fair that they had here, and so I had my book sitting out, and, and she came over and talked to me, and I started telling her about some of the events that occurred around Fort Hayes, and and uh, she said, well, you ought to come and, and do uh, a talk here. And I said, oh, that'd be great. I, I, I'll do that. And she said, okay, what's the topic of your thing? And I had, uh, you know, I just... Uh, I didn't have a, a, anything, so I just blurted out uh, life and death at, at Hayes or at Fort Hayes. And uh, so I didn't really have a uh, clear uh, idea, I guess, uh, as to what this would, uh, would be, which uh, we have here today. Uh, but I had a program that... Um, that I developed a, a number of years ago called Death on a Boardwalk and it was about gunfight, gunfights and stuff. But there was more to uh, the story of Fort Hayes and Hayes City than just gunfights. And uh, so... I didn't get that. Could you try again? Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Um, be quiet. And uh, so, anyway... With her now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I got to thinking about uh, what life and death was like out at the fort and, and out west, basically. Uh, and the area was uh, being settled uh, right before the Civil War started, and then after the Civil War, there was a lot of people that came out west. And there were all kinds of uh, things that would uh, cause you concern and maybe get you killed. Uh, there were a lot of animals out here, rattlesnakes and wolves and, and uh, uh, mountain lions and bears. And a lot of stuff was right in here at that time. And, and of course, there were people out here. Uh, we were coming across the southern Cheyenne land and uh, of course they weren't very happy with that so there was that danger and there were also a lot of uh, um, bandits, uh, high women uh, and that sort of thing so you could get robbed and, and killed and, and that kind of stuff and another very important part of this was the weather and nowadays we're blessed with having uh, meteorologists that tell us basically what's going to happen uh, in at least the next 24 hours with storms and that kind of thing. But back in these days, of course, they didn't have that. And they could see the clouds building out west, uh, for instance, and uh, they say, oh, well, it looks like we might get some rain. And sometimes you got rain, sometimes you didn't, sometimes you got snow. I mean, snowstorms came up and, and would just uh, inundate an area with, uh, with the amount of snow uh, and that sort of thing. And... So that brings up to my mind uh, an event that occurred that maybe some of you uh, know about, uh, but maybe you don't know the whole story, uh, and it involved uh, Elizabeth Custer. 
and uh, she was uh, she appeared at the old Fort Hayes, which was uh, five miles south of Walker. And the way that transpired is that um, General Custer and the Seventh Cavalry were part of the Hancock expedition that, that went down to Larned, and they were going to ostensibly have a peace, uh, sign some peace treaties with the Cheyenne. And Hancock wasn't very good at that. They were down near Fort Larned, and uh, the Indians got really worried that the Cheyenne got really worried that that they were going to end up like. The, the the Indians at Sand Creek, and they were going to be massacred. And uh, so in the night, they all took off. They left all their village there, all their teepees and that kind of stuff, but they just left and headed north. And Hancock gave Custer instructions to go and follow them. And so he takes his 7th Cavalry and he starts heading north following the trail of the, of the Cheyenne uh, north. And uh, he got as far as Fort Hayes over here uh, south of Walker. And uh, he ran out of provisions. He didn't have any forage for his horses. He didn't have food for his men. Uh, they just needed a lot of stuff. And Fort Hayes didn't have any of that stuff. They hadn't got their deliveries, I guess. And uh, so he had to wait there for several weeks uh, and the, um, the fact that he was there and his wife, who he loved very much, they were very close, and she was at Fort Riley, and, and she wanted to come out, but they were corresponding with one another through letters and so on. And, and uh, uh, he said, no, no, you don't need to come out. It's pretty dangerous out here. And, uh, but uh, she was pretty headstrong, and she got with some of the other uh, women uh, that had husbands uh, out here, and they got in an ambulance uh, with a small escort, an ambulance. They took that because it had uh, bench seats in it. It was one of the only wagon that had that. And it was covered. It was, it was uh, uh, so you were covered from the weather and you had to sit on, uh, uh, on that rather than have to walk or anything like that. The railroad wasn't out here uh, yet. And so she shows up here and uh, they have uh, some time together. And then finally the supplies arrive at Fort Hayes and he, uh, Custer and his 7th Cavalry, they take off uh, and they go, uh, their first stop was supposed to be Fort McPherson in Nebraska. And so they take off. Well, it had, it had, there had been some storms and the, the ground was pretty saturated with water and so on. And, and uh, Elizabeth, uh, he told Elizabeth to go home. She didn't want to do that. She wanted to wait till he got done with his scout uh, and was supposed to come back to Fort Hayes. And uh, so she said she was going to stay there uh, with some of the other wives and so on. And she said, but I'm worried about the storms. And he uh, put up this tent and he had it all tied down real good and everything. And, and he said, oh, this will stand up to any storm that, that comes along. Famous last words. Uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, he left and they were there. They really, Elizabeth Custer really liked being uh, out on the prairie camping and that sort of thing. She really liked it. And she was there with uh, a friend of hers from uh, her younger days named Diana. Uh, with, there also was uh, Eliza, who was the servant to the Custers, uh, more like a, a close friend, really, than, than a servant at that point. But uh, she was a black woman. And, and uh, there were several other uh, wives of, of men there. And um, Custer, uh, he said, I'm going to put your tent up on this hill. And I've got a picture here somewhere. There. This is basically what uh, the uh, first four haze looked like. This photo that was taken. Uh, well, I'll explain this. But it was, it was uh, stone buildings and, and sod buildings and, and that sort of thing. And and uh, but it was filled with soldiers, and uh, it was on the south side of Big Creek, and so on the north side of Big Creek there were some hills and things, and, and uh, George put uh, his wife's tent on the top of the tallest hill he could find, and he said that'll that'll be great. Well, storm clouds built uh, out west, and they slowly came, uh, and. 
they struck the the fort and actually uh, the storm uh, hit north or uh, west, uh, filled up the creek. Now Big Creek was not, uh, you know, it was a, a slow flowing, uh, uh, meandering stream until the storm got there, and then uh, it dumped so much water uh, on uh, the prairie out there that there was an, immediately a flood. And uh, so this happened in the middle of the night. So uh, the ladies. Um, wake up and uh, they look out and, and here was all this flood water coming through there and there were trees being uh, they were flowing down uh, the, the river the flood and uh, there were um, men that were being uh, uh, that were being swept away and they decided there was nothing that they couldn't sit there and do nothing and so, and women at this time were a frail little creatures who, who uh, you know, they had to be looked after and everything, but, but they were different, uh, yeah, sort of. And, and uh, uh, the th uh, four women, uh, Elizabeth Custer, uh, Jenny Barnett, who was, uh, whose husband was there, uh, Eliza and Diana, went out and they tried to save some of these men. And they needed a rope, and so Eliza went back to uh, the back of, the, of their camp and got her clothesline cord. And she came out and they rescued several uh, men. And that's where the story, I'm gonna read a, a short section of, of my book, uh, War, War Clouds on the High Plains, and it'll kind of explain a little bit about this picture. And <clears throat> so anyway, the men, the ladies were rescuing men. And so the, it picks up. The ladies did not stop there. Beyond their success, or buoyed by their success, they ran back to the water's edge and were able to rescue two more men that night with the mundane and humble instrument of utilitarian housekeeping, that handy clothesline. The drowning men were all part of an escort that had recently arrived at Fort Hayes and they had bedded down on a small hill upstream from the camp of the seventh. When the hill was was suddenly an island, the cavalrymen had attempted to swim their horses across the waters to the far shore, but the strong current squelched their plans. A group of black infantrymen were still on the island, uh, which quickly submerged under three feet of water. An officer was able to swim across uh, with a rope, and a wagon bed was pulled over, thus making a ferry of sorts. Once loaded, the men were all pulled to the, to the women's island, and this is the island that Elizabeth and, and because it was the tallest one, tallest hill. But the water continued to rise until it appeared everyone on the women's island was in danger of being washed away. What do we do now, Libby? asked Diana. I don't know, responded Libby. Pray, I suppose. The four women huddled together at a spot as close as they could to the center and thus the highest point of the island. Captain Barnett approached them and said, ladies, we are, attempt, uh, we are going to attempt to ferry you across on horses. But the water is so swift, said Jenny, his wife. We are going to try sending a horse and rider across that we believe, uh, across what we believe is the shallowest part. If he gets across with no problem, we will take each of you over one at a time. Very well, the lady said, although not with a high degree of enthusiasm. They watched as the rider entered the muddy floodwaters. He barely made it halfway before he was forced to turn back. The current was too strong. What now, Libby asked Brewster, there's another officer there. We will formulate a new plan. We promise we will not leave him. Remain here. Bent against the force of the wind and the rain, he made his way over to a cluster of officers and men who were discussing the situation rather animatedly, arms gesticulating wildly as they paced back and forth at the edge of the waters. The current is much too strong for the ladies to manage, said Breach, or another officer there. Their bedclothes will not allow them to swim, said one of the cavalrymen. I asked them earlier, said Brewster. They can't swim, so the matter of their bedclothes is moot. We can't just leave them here, said another cavalryman. We aren't leaving anyone anywhere, Barnes cried angrily. Then what alternative is there? We must face facts, gentlemen, said Brewster. We cannot let them die, not this way. 
Their fate is no longer in our hands. It belongs to the Almighty. Do any of you want to look General Custer in the face and say we allowed his wife to drown? Custer was a pretty important guy. Then. <laughs> of course not, but what do we do? Just let the water take her and the other women? I would only hope that I would be swept away as well, said Barnett, never to be seen again. Although concerned for all the women, his comment was more about his wife than the others. The only thing worse than having to tell the general that his wife drowned is having to tell him she was been swept away to oblivion. Brewster looked up and futilely swept the rainwater from his face, only to have it immediately replaced by a seemingly never-ending deluge, searching for some answer. In the lightning punctuated darkness, his eyes focused on two Gatling guns parked not far from where the women were huddled. The rapid shooting guns were relatively new to the scene of battle, having seen limited use during the late war, the Civil War. Uh, six revolving barrels fired at the rate of three to four hundred rounds a minute. American generals were slow to accept them, however, as they were prone to jamming or cumbersome to transport, and the carriage was too lightweight for sustained movement over uneven ground. The 7th Cavalry had been given some test, but Custer left them behind at Fort Hayes when he went to Fort McPherson. In the instantaneous lightning flash, Brewster saw the Gatling guns as not new innovative weapons, but as me uh, me mechanical marvels that weighed upwards of 600 pounds each. Surely the floodwaters would not dislodge them. There is one thing we can do, he said slowly. And what is that? Tell us, man, and quickly. She and the other women cannot be allowed to be swept away, perhaps never to be found. If the general is to grieve, it shall be over a body and not but a memory. We must secure the women to the wheels of those guns. What? You must be mad. It's the only way. There are no trees on this island. Tents will be washed away as soon as water gets there, gets three or four feet deep. We only, the only hope is that those guns will be too heavy to, for the current to carry. My God, has it come to that? I agree, Barnett said reluctantly, but we can't do it now. We must wait until we abs are absolutely certain the flood will overtake us. And I volunteer to remain with my wife and the other women to the end. I as well, said the cavalryman, almost in unison. We're on in, in agreement then, said Brewster, but not until it is positive all is lost. Do we tell them? Heaven is no man, said Barnett. The thought of it might send them into hysterics, because, you know, they're frail little doves. I will talk to them, try to calm them down. And he sloshed over to the women. Have you made a decision, asked Jenny. What? Barnett stopped for an instant that she might have overheard their conversation, but quickly realized that would have been impossible as the rain and thunder were still blotting out most other sounds. No, that is, uh, it seems as if the storm might be lifting a bit, he lied. Would you be more comfortable inside one of the tents, he asked. It's just as bad inside, said Libby. Libby is uh, Custer's name for Elizabeth. The rain comes through the canvas as if it wasn't even there. We shall wait it out like everyone else. Barnett's admired the women's courage. The water continued to rise slowly until the survivor's shoes were covered. But there, it stopped. Cold and shivering, the women held on to one another, providing each other with comfort as best they could. And I'm going to stop there. Um, obviously, they, uh, they survived that. Uh, but it just shows the uh, it just shows uh, the uh, oh, there um, it just shows uh, the fact that that the land was new and it was exciting to be there, but it was very dangerous. And this photo was taken after the floodwaters receded. And uh, you can see uh, some rubble there in the, in the lower right-hand corner by that barrel. Uh, and the fort looks pretty much abandoned. That's because it was. The flagpole doesn't have a flag flying or anything. And after the flood, 
they decided they better move the fort, and so they moved it all down here south of, of what's mm -hmm. now Hayes City or Hayes, uh, and uh, the fort stayed there for for uh, a long time, uh, for 25 years, 20, 23 years, I guess. Um, and it was a much nicer looking fort than, than this year. But, but um, when you think about life and death on the prairie uh, on the, in the West, uh, one thing, uh, to me anyway, comes to mind pretty quickly, and that is gunfights. And I have a little video here uh, um, that I don't know if it'll play on this probably can't see it very well, but you'll know it. But you're all old enough here to to know ah, what this is. Is that almost never happened in real life? <laughs> uh, there were some shootouts that occurred like that, uh, similar to that, but most um, most uh, battles uh, of that kind were essentially based on the duel. This is just a, uh, a photo showing a couple of guys. Uh, in Europe who uh, had a disagreement and they fought their duel with swords. Uh, but it wasn't just a, a, a man's game. Uh, here's a, a drawing that, that showed uh, two women who were uh, at odds with one another back in the, in the 1700s. And uh, they decided to have themselves a duel. And uh, so they got these flintlock uh, pistols here, single shot pistols. And uh, they did their thing, you know, walked uh, 10 paces and turned and fired. And um, because of their, <laughs> working on updates. <laughs> 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 uh, because of their unfamiliarity with firearms, they both missed. And uh, so they, they got together afterwards and, and became friends and so on. And I don't know what's going to happen here, but um, but uh, most of the the conflicts that occurred out west and here in Fort Hayes uh, were um, the results of. In my research, I found uh, the the three A's. Uh, the triple A is what I uh, contribute. Or, uh, to the, the process of, of these gunfights taking place. Uh, first was alcohol, because you had, you had the West was wide open after the Civil War. There were all these little towns that would pop up. Uh, there was no law in, in these towns in the beginning. There was no police force or... or uh, no, pretty sorry. Yeah. There was no police force or sheriffs or, or marshals uh, in the early days, and uh, but there were saloons in just about every town, and so you mix alcohol with guns, and everybody carried gun for for protection and and so on, uh, and you find a lot of people shooting one another, and so alcohol, anger, uh, because you get guys that are drunk and they're they they get mad at one another for some. Uh, and uh, and then uh, you go to fighting, but the reason that you never saw hardly ever saw these gunfights out in the street like uh, gun smoke uh, is is because um, you it was it was difficult to uh, stand there draw your pistol and shoot with any degree of accuracy. And so what normally would happen is uh, there would be some sort of ambush. 
So you get two guys in the saloon and they're, uh, they're disagreeing with things. And, and uh, so one of them goes out, goes around the corner, stands in the, in the shadows of, of, of uh, the lights or the sun or whatever was uh, up at the time and wait for, the, for his antagonist to come out and then shoot him in the back. That, that happened a lot. And there were also times when big groups would get together. There's a story uh, that I believe happened in Dodge where there were uh, some drovers who drove their cattle up to Dodge and there were two camps uh, and uh, they got paid with, at the end of the drive and they got paid and everybody went to the saloons and uh, the two groups got mad at one another for some, some reason. And they all went out on the street and started shooting at one another and 5,000 rounds of ammunition were fired off, and nobody was hurt. <laughs> they were all drunk. They, you know. and, and so uh, what, what we have here in, in at Hayes is uh, there, were a number of, there were a number of stories about people who killed one another in, in uh, Hayes City, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and, but there is one in particular that I want to relate if <laughs> and um, it occurs and it's described in uh, my newest book here uh, Shadows of the Conflict and uh, Another thing that, that um, these gunfights, uh, a lot of times you didn't use a pistol. They used rifles. Rifles were more accurate. Uh, you could get further away from the guy and still shoot with a certain degree of accuracy, even if you were drunk. Uh, and uh, so uh, rifles. And, and in the photographs that you have of the outlaws, and uh, which there are a few photos, uh, and the, the law men, the, the sheriffs and, and all that, is you don't find somebody with a, their pistol down uh, tied to their leg so that they can draw real quick because you don't have any of that accuracy, you know. They're all up around the waist and that, so the guns are right here and primarily that's to keep the pistol in the holster. Uh, uh, Particularly when you're riding, uh, it, it causes problems uh, if it's, it's down on your leg. In fact, here, down here in Big Creek in years past, they found two pistols that were in the creek. They're all rusted away and uh, uh, there's not much left of them, but the cylinder is there and part of the, part of the barrel and part of the mechanism. And it's rusted away and you can see the, the rounds that are still in each uh, cylinder. So what happened was the horse was jumping in the water and it fell out. The pistol fell out of the guy's holster and fell in the water and they couldn't find it. So it laid there until somebody else comes and finds it. So they were, uh, you know, there were they were not uh, gunfighters like you like you see in the movies and so on. In fact, they weren't even called gunfighters. Gunfights is a term that came out in the in the 1870s in newspapers and things like that, but. Uh, the actual guys that that made their living with the gun uh, were called pistoliers or shootists or simply bad men, <laughs> uh, and uh, and they were the ones who who uh, who who had their uh, you know who who robbed people and that and that sort of thing. And I'll show you a couple pictures of some of the bad men.
there were a lot of, of uh, gunfights uh, in in the east as well. And you can see this picture here. This is uh, Aaron Burr and, and Alexander Hampton. That was a duel. Uh, but uh, out west, there were very many duels. Uh, this is one of the bad men of, of the times, uh, Charles Bowles, who was known as Black Bart. And he was a very, uh, he was a very different uh, criminal or a robber than, than most uh, of the time and the, the ones you see him. He was uh, afraid of horses, so he didn't ride a, ride a horse. Uh, he was known as the gentleman bandit because he would write poems, and a lot of times when he'd rob a stagecoach, he and his gang, uh, he would give the ladies a poem. Uh, <laughs> so it was and, and, um, and he didn't carry a gun, so he, his, his, the men in his uh, gang were the ones who, uh, who did all that. Then there were some, like Frank Canton here, who was a, who was a lawman, and he uh, got tired of arresting guys and they getting off and so on. And he decided that it was a, a much more lucrative to be a criminal than to be a, a lawman. And so uh, he did that. There were a few women bandits, such as Della Rose here, uh, who was part of the Wild Bunch, uh, but she was never depicted in the movie, uh, The Sundance Kid. Sundance Kid. But this just shows you some of the law enforcement men and how they wore their guns. And again, with the rifles, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, men who preferred to carry rifles uh, to do business with. And a lot of this, uh, the idea of these gunfights and so on, started with these dime novels uh, with Buffalo Bill and, and uh, Deadwood Dick and some of these other guys. They were very exciting uh, and uh, uh, they were uh, not necessarily uh, Truthful. Uh, they just the guys who wrote these just wanted to write an exciting story, and they just used Buffalo Bill and and so on. Uh, movies also uh, these uh, a lot of movies here. This is one of the earliest movies, probably the earliest cowboy movie, 1903, The Great Train Robbery. And uh, again, this shows uh, uh, a fight outside of a saloon, and you notice a couple guys have rifles there, and of course. Um, this is from, uh, still from uh, the movie Tombstone with uh, the Herp gang and the, and the Clanton gang. And in the movie Tombstone, the fight at the OK Corral is depicted pretty, pretty accurately in that movie. Uh, and this, like most of these gunfights, lasted 30 seconds is all it lasted. And uh, that's, uh, that's depicted very well in the movie. In a, an older movie, a movie I really like, the My Darling Clementine, uh, that has uh, um, the OK Corral and the, and the fight lasts, gosh, I don't know, 10 or 12 minutes in that. This is an early picture of Hayes City, 1876, and on the left is some of the saloons and so on that that occurred, uh, or that were, that were built there. This is uh, the corner of uh, north, uh, north side of 10th Street where those saloons are. Now we'll go through this. Photography was in its infancy uh, right around this time, and so a lot of the men uh, who were killed were put up uh, on display, basically, uh, like the, the OK Corral beds and, and uh, the Dalton gang. But this is a unique picture, photograph, uh, of uh, an event that happened right here uh, in Hayes City in 1873. And uh, I'm going to read a short section of uh, uh, my book here that explains this. Now remember again that the facts <coughs> here are uh, the basic story is fact and I just added a lot of uh, dialogue uh, in, in here. So uh, the, the background of this is that the 6th Cavalry was in camp south of the creek here and east of the fort a little ways, and it was payday. And one of the things the men loved about payday is you get to go into town and go to the saloons and so on. And so this, this story involves uh, 
five men, uh, David Roberts, George Sumner, Peter Welch, a man named Owen Owens, and an infantryman. And they had spent the night drinking in the saloons and so on. <coughs> According to newspaper accounts, uh, Sumner and Roberts were fighting about something all night. They were arguing about something all night. And so I've invented a, uh, a scenario that takes care of that. So anyway, they leave one of the saloons. And, hey, fellas, Sumner said, apparently forgetting his quarrel with Roberts for the moment. You ain't gonna quit now, are you? Come on, let's go down to Goddard's. Oh, Si will give us a drink. Si Goddard's dance hall and saloon. It was a popular place. Sumner, Robert, Roberts, Owens, Welsh, and Fenwick was the infantryman. Walked down the boardwalk and crossed the street to Si Goddard's dance hall. But it was closed. So Welsh sat down on the steps. Well, what you sitting down for, Pat? Sumner asked. I'm gonna rest here a bit, Welsh responded. Thatch a keg of beans, Pat, said Sumner, as he, Roberts, and Fenwick stumbled down the street to Henry Hound Dog Kelly's Pharaoh House and Saloon near the end of the block. He ain't ever gonna get my name, is he? Welsh asked and Owens. <laughs> Probably not. Owens asked his real name was Pete and Peter. Uh, and he got called there. Anyway, when the three reached Kelly's, Fenwick began to rap on the door, but he threw as he threw back his arm. He passed out and Farrell fell squarely on his back on the boardwalk. Well, ain't that a corker, said Sumner. Them riflers, they can't hold their liquor. The cavalry and the infantry had names for one another. Uh, the cavalry called, and these were six cavalrymen, called infantrymen riflers because they carried rifles. And the infantrymen called the cavalrymen maneuver spreaders because of their horses. Um, so, uh, they can't hold their liquor. Hey, Davy, maybe he's got a few coins left. And he bent down to search the pockets of the infantry. What are you doing, said Robert? You can't roll that man. Oh, he won't know no difference, Sumner chuckled. He's so drunk up, he won't remember how much money he spent, and we can have another drink. That's stealing, George, even if it is from an infantryman. Ah, go soak your head, Private Goody Two-Shoes. At least we won't owe, you won't owe me that drink this away. Damn you, I told you I don't owe you nothing. And Roberts gave Sumner a hard push off the boardwalk. What's the matter with you, Davy? You want to fight me? Okay, I'll drop hats with his. Sumner reached for his revolver. Roberts pushed him again, knocking him down, preventing him from drawing his piece, and then walked down the boardwalk and across the street to where Owens and Welch watched the developments in front of Cy Goddard's. Sumner got up and drew his revolver. Come back here, Roberts, he yelled. As Roberts walked away, you turn around or I'll plug you right now, you cur. Go away, yelled Roberts. I don't want to kill you. Kill me, Sumner cried out as he reholstered his revolver. Ha, you ain't got the guts. Stealing from the unconscious infantryman was now forgotten as Sumner's anger rose higher and higher. You're the biggest coward I ever seen, Roberts. You don't you won't pay off your debts, and I'd be doing the army a favor to get rid of you. I don't know you nothing, you fool, Robert said, and then abruptly stopped and whirled around to face the oncoming Sumner, who couldn't stop quickly enough and ran into Roberts. Roberts grabbed Sumner by the collar and stuck the muzzle of his revolver under Sumner's chin. Don't push me, Sumner, he growled. I'd like nothing more right now than to put a ball in your brain. Whoa there, cried Owens as he ran up to the two men. No need to do no shooting now. Tell it to this lunatic, Robert said, pushing Sumner as hard as he could, causing him to fall to the ground. I done told you, you fool. Cold-footed bastard, Sumner said. I'll drop hats with you any time. Go to hell, Robert yelled as he reached the boardwalk where Welch stood, observing the developing fight. Sumner ran after him, hopping onto the boardwalk in front of Robert's and turned toward him facing the streets. Roberts, uh, his back to the streets, stood glaring at Sumner. Come on, Owens, Sumner says. Drop your hat so I can plug this little liver coward. Now, now, wait, you two. I ain't gonna be responsible for this. You both, we all had too much to drink and we we just need to go sleep them off now. I'm begging you. Let's go, let's just drop this and head back to the fort. 
I ain't going nowhere till I show this no good louse what for. Just drop your hat, Owens. You know how this is done? He'll, uh, you know how this is done, Roberts. He'll drop his hat, meaning Owens, and we draw when it hits the ground. This is a kind of an example of, of the old take 10 steps and turn and shoot. Uh, it's just a, a, a term that was used back in those days. Come on, you coward. I ain't doing it, shouted Owens. Do it, Owens, Sumner said, fingering his revolver. No, Roberts took a step back. He had finally had his fill of Sumner's badgering and threats, and Roberts' countenance took on a more sinister look as he put on his fighting face. He gingerly fingered the handle of his revolver and said, You should listen to him, Owens, and drop your hat. I'd like nothing better right now than to end this his way. Owens realized he was in a most precarious situation. It was no longer two drunks arguing over nothing. It was two men bent on ending their disagreement with violence. Everything hinged on what he said now. He glanced over at Welsh imploringly, but he immediately saw Welsh would be of no help as he stood still other than a slight wobble in his stance, hands in his pockets, a mirthless grin on his face, the result of an excess of alcohol and ignorance of what was about to unfold in front of him. There is nothing like a shock to the system to sober a man up, and that is what happened to the three men, Owens, Sumner, and Roberts. Owens was acutely aware of what would happen if he said the wrong thing or made the wrong movement. The two men might interpret as a signal to draw. He briefly thought of jumping between the two men to break the stalemate, but he didn't want to risk getting shot himself. Sumner and Roberts were totally focused and ready to take the situation to the point where there was no turning back. It was all up to Owens now, and he did not like the situation he was in. He spoke slowly, so there could be no misinterpretation. I will not do this, he said. You are both crazy, and I refuse to be put in the middle. I'm going back to the fort, and I'm begging you one last time, come with me. With that, he slowly turned and gingerly walked away from the scene, hoping that at least one of the men would follow him. As he got further away, he, strengthened, he lengthened his stride and sped up his pace. He got no more than a dozen steps when he heard the shots. That's not there. Give me something to think about. Well, uh, obviously, uh, these men uh, uh, shot one another. And this photo, uh, there was a, they were laying there still in the morning when everybody got up and there was a photographer staying in one of the hotels, and, and he came down and took uh, these two pictures. They're slightly different. Let's see here, this is a, a more bleached out picture than this. But um, <laughs> Sumner is the guy that laying uh, on the boardwalk in front there at the bottom of the picture. And uh, Welsh is the guy in the back there. And this, this is just such a sad story. Uh, above and beyond somebody that, that killed somebody else. But uh, Welch, for instance, was a brand new trooper. He had just enlisted a few months before this. And he had just gone along with these guys just to have somebody to go drinking with, I guess. And when he was going through these saloons, he grabbed a couple of glasses and took them with him. One was a beer glass and the other was a whiskey glass. And you could see him laying here and um, you can see a lump right here, which is one his hand in this pocket, and there's another one here. You can see his hand there. He was holding on to those two glasses. He didn't want to lose them, and uh, he and he got shot. And he wasn't doing anything. I mean, he was just standing there watching. But what happened was Sumner here, who was really the troublemaker in this this whole thing, he drew his revolver and fired. And either he saw multiple people in front of him or he was just uh, that bad a shot, but he he, turned, he pulled his gun out and he fired and he hit Welch. Uh, so uh, Roberts is standing in front of him and Welch is standing over here, so he, he shot him. And at the, by accident, the bullet went into his mouth and up into his brain and he, he died instantly and he just fell back which is 
what you see here. And when he did that, uh, my opinion is he hesitated for a second because he fired and Roberts was still standing. <coughs> Uh, and he didn't notice that, that Welch was dead. And that pause gave Roberts a chance to get his gun out, and he shot twice, hitting Roberts in the chest with the first one, and he fell back, and the second shot hit him in the head. Both were kill shots. So. Uh, and uh, Roberts uh, was standing there, uh, and he knew he was, this was a trouble, this was a bad situation. He got on his uh, horse and he went, uh, he deserted, he went to his family's uh, home in, uh, uh, in eastern Kansas and the army sent the patrols out to find him and they eventually found him and brought him back. And even though he was shooting in self-defense, Sumner fired first and uh, was, was egging him on and so on, they held a court-martial and Roberts was found guilty of murder and he was uh, sent to prison for 25 years, but uh, after about seven years, he was given a pardon for some reason. We don't know. We don't know what they were arguing about or anything like that. And it was, uh, they took the bodies back to the 6th Cavalry Camp, and the people were, the soldiers were kind of dumbfounded because these were all, these guys were friends. Roberts and Owens and, and Sumner were friends. Peter Welsh had had no part in this other than he was just going along with these guys. And I think that's how a lot of these, quote, gunfights uh, happened, is that uh, they, people knew one another and they just got carried away uh, and uh, they were drinking too much. Uh, it was just, you know, that uh, alcohol and uh, anger and uh, ambush is, is the three things. All these these guys were ambushed, but uh, it was just it was just a very sad uh, episode in uh, the history of uh, Hayes and Fort Hayes. And uh, um, this isn't the only one. There were a number of other uh, incidents that I don't have time to go into. But um, so uh, that's basically my program. I want to thank. Uh, Samantha for inviting me here. I want to thank all of you for being here and I hope you learned a little bit or were entertained at least uh, with some of the things that we did. And I, if you have any questions uh, about anything, I'd be glad to, to answer them. I do have some books over here if you're so inclined uh, to buy one of those. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bob. That was very interesting, minus the technical difficulties we had. You have to have them always in the presentation. Um, I also want to have a, uh, do a shout out to the Schmidt Foundation, which actually funded this event today. Um, we're in the Schmidt Community Commons, so thank you very much to the Schmidt Foundation. Um, as Bob mentioned, he does have a couple of books over there for sale. Um, so you can read uh, more from the passages that he already talked about. And again, if you have any questions for Bob, please feel free to ask those now. Any questions? Yeah. Bob, did they change the name to Fort Hayes when they were still at Fletcher? Yeah, uh, Fort Fletcher was a, a stop along the Smoky Hill Trail. And it was a stage station to begin with. And uh, the Army occupied it and it became Fort Fletcher, named after the then living governor of the state of Missouri. And uh, the 13th Missouri Cavalry was one of the units uh, that was stationed there for a brief period. And I think they are the ones who came up with the name Fort Fletcher. Um, and it was open for six months. And uh, then uh, the, uh, David Butterfield, who had the rights to use the Smoky Hill Trail, kind of like, uh, well, I don't, don't want to get into this a great big long explanation, but um, they closed Fort Fletcher because there, there was no need for the Army to be there anymore. And uh, six months later, six months, the fort was open for six months, six months after that, they reopened it because the railroad was being built out west. And uh, the military decided that uh, it would be better if forts were named after a particularly dead Civil War heroes. And uh, 
Alexander Hayes was, uh, he had never set foot in Kansas, but he was a friend of uh, one of the generals who said, I think you should name Fort Hayes. And so it was renamed Fort Hayes, and then uh, the name stayed when they moved it over here after the plane. Is the local information usually is the reason it was moved from the southeast part of Ellis County to where it's at today, the, well, it's now the old fort, was because of the severe flood out there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Elizabeth Custer experienced. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.